Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. On December the 24th, 1885, a few days before he was questioned on suspicion of murder, John Larson, a farmhand, went over to his employer's house after being invited to spend Christmas with them. Their names were Matilda and Patrick Rooney, an elderly couple who lived at their farm outside Seneca, Illinois. The couple were merry and filled with seasonal cheer, and their drinking reflected that. The pair were known to be heavy drinkers, and Christmas was no exception. Being a farmhand, John was used to early night, so he excused himself around 8pm and headed to bed to the spare room in the couple's home. The couple's son, who was also named John, left his parents' home around some time after that, and all was peaceful until the morning. John had a somewhat peaceful sleep aside from a small breathing problem that struck him in the early hours. John woke briefly, finding himself unable to breathe, but he wasn't fully awake for the incident, so once his breathing returned to normal, he fell back asleep until the morning. The first thing that struck John upon waking was the smell. The air smelt foul. What's more, the bedding was covered in soot, and there was a strange haze filling the room. Naturally concerned, John rushed from his bed and began searching for Matilda and Patrick. As he made his way downstairs, he spotted through an open door a body lying across the couple's bedroom floor. The body, he quickly deduced, was that of a now deceased Patrick Rooney, and too horrified to go any further out of fear he would suffocate or die by whatever substance may be in the air, John ran from the house to find their son. John alerted the neighbours and their son, John Rooney, who sent for a doctor. Police were quickly on the scene and entered the putrid smelling house. The body of Patrick Rooney lay on the floor of his bedroom, as John Larson had informed them. The doctor who arrived the next day to help carry out an inquest reasoned that Patrick had died of smoke inhalation, caused by a fire which was started in the kitchen. The kitchen sat just beside the Rooney's bedroom and upon entering, the police were hit with even more of an intense smell. The walls of the kitchen were covered in soot, but not the type of soot that they were used to. The soot had a greasy texture to it. In the middle of the kitchen was a large table, upon which was a half-burned candle. More obscurely, beside the kitchen table was a 2.5 by 3 foot hole in the wooden floor, and at the bottom of the hole, under the house, lay a pile of human ashes and bones. The doctor who examined the remains found a human skull, a cervical bone, vertebrae, six inches of a right femur, and a badly burned ilium. He also found a pair of shoes. The shoes belonged to Matilda Rooney, and inside the shoes were her burned but still largely intact feet. The woman who just two days ago weighed 160 pounds was now just 12 pounds of ash and bones. The police's first thought was murder, and they turned their attention to the two Johns, the one who had stayed with the couple that night of their deaths and their son, who again stood to gain financially from their deaths, but both were cleared. An outline on the bed supported John Larson's claim that he slept throughout the night, and there was no evidence John Rooney had done anything to kill his father or start a fire. No accelerant was found at the scene, and his father had no signs of injury. Dr. Floyd Clendenin, a doctor from Port Huron, Michigan, officially concluded that Matilda had died of spontaneous human combustion of the human body. Her husband, Patrick, had died from asphyxiation from the fumes. He wasn't the only one. John Larson, the poor farmhand, died just two weeks later from lung damage. An autopsy found soot and greasy residue in his lungs, the same that was found on the walls of the kitchen in the Rooney's home. But before we get any further, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website platform for entrepreneurs to stand out and succeed online. Whether you're just starting out or managing a growing brand, Squarespace makes it easy to create a beautiful website, engage with your audience, and sell anything from products to content to time, all in one place, 
all on your terms. Are you new to building websites? Well, you can design a gorgeous, unique and professional looking website tailored to your brand, thanks to Squarespace Blueprint. And with Squarespace's integrated, optimized SEO tools, you can get your new website launched and discovered quickly. And you don't need to know any coding, thanks to Squarespace's next generation website editor, Fluid Engine, which lets you drag and drop your content where you want it, on a desktop or mobile. And if you're a freelance creative wanting to launch your own courses, then Squarespace is the place for you. You can upload your videos and then add a paywall, set your own prices and then charge a one-time fee or sell subscriptions, whatever works best for your brand. There is some biscuit eating S ASMR next to me happening. I hope you're enjoying it. So if you want to expand your business or just build a beautiful website for your blogging leisure, then head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash lady of the library to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. So how did Matilda spontaneously burst into flames? Did the candle on the table? Or perhaps a cigarette she was attempting to light from the candle? The alcohol in her system or the fat on her body create a wick effect, whereby a person is allegedly kept aflame by a continuous source of fuel, in this case, human fat. Or could a buildup of gases in the body combined with raised blood alcohol level lead to self-ignition? The theories at the time were wild, just over 20 years before the death of Matilda Rooney, one of the most prominent experts in forensic medicine, J. L. Casper wrote in his 1861 Handbook of the Practice of Forensic Medicine that spontaneous human combustion was a myth. Much more recently, in 2005, Forensic Pathology Principles and Practice, published by Academic Press, stated that, quote, spontaneous human combustion does not exist. So why in the span of 300 years have over 200 cases of alleged spontaneous human combustion been documented? What is really happening? What is really happening scientifically? And how did these cases capture the imagination of society and make it become a uh, and make it become an urban legend. In 1663, microscopist Thomas Bartholin wrote about a tragic case of a woman in Paris who died in her sleep by a fire. The bed, he noted, was strangely untouched by any fire damage. Paul Raleigh published a similar story in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in 1745. He wrote that a 62-year-old Countess Cornelia Bandy had said one evening that she felt dull and heavy after dining, and so she went to bed. The next morning, her maid entered the Countess's bedroom, only to find a pile of ashes with two legs protruding from the smouldering remains. The first book on the subject was written in French by the author Ionis Dupont and was published in Leiden, the Netherlands, in 1763. A pamphlet in 1806 titled An Essay on the Combustion of Humans by Pierre Lair believed that alcohol abuse was the cause behind the phenomenon. In 1882, a Victorian magazine titled Notes and Queries published the findings of Dr. Lindsley, who had examined 19 cases of alleged spontaneous human combustion between 1692 and 1892 and he found that the individuals who died of such a cause were known to be, quote, habitually drunken or frequently indulged in alcohol. The tone of the piece was one of moral judgment and shame on the victims. Jeannie Safin died in Chorley, London in 1982 at the age of 61. She had severe mental disabilities and had been cared for her whole life by her father, Jack Safran, then aged 82. Whilst in the kitchen, Jack noticed a bright flash in the corner of his eye. And turning to Jeannie to ask if she'd also seen it, Jack was horrified to find his daughter was on fire while sitting perfectly still in her chair, her hands on her lap. Don Carroll, Jack's son-in-law, entered the house just when the incident occurred and the two men rushed to put the flames out on Jeannie. The flesh on her face, hands and abdomen had been entirely burnt away to the subcutaneous fat and sadly Jeannie fell into a coma and died eight days later. Don Carroll told... Don Carroll told authorities that he recalled flames coming out of her mouth like a dragon, though no burn marks were found near or in her mouth. Panic and fear can, can take control of the imagination of those subjugated to such horrific and devastating sights. But how did Jeannie become a light? Here is what the police concluded. At the time, the only source of ignition was the pilot light in the gas stove, and Jeannie was wearing nylon, a flammable material. Earlier that day, Jack Safran had emptied the ashes of his pipe and refilled with fresh tobacco, and investigators theorised that ember from the discarded pipe fell onto Jeannie's clothing. 
When Don entered the house, the gust of wind from the door fueled the ember. Her official cause of death was recorded by the coroner, Dr. John Burton, as bronchopneumonia due to burns. When the family asked about the possibility of spontaneous human combustion, he replied such a verdict could not be drawn because there's no such thing. On December the 22nd, 2010, 76-year-old Michael Faherty died in his home in Galway, Ireland. His charred corpse was found lying on his back, his head near the fireplace. There was little damage to the room, only the charred ceiling above his burned body on the floor. Dr. Mike Green, a professor in pathology, examined one case of spontaneous human combustion, as well as a history of reports. Quote, this is the picture which described time and time again, he said. Even the most experienced rescue workers or forensic scientists take a sharp breath when they come across the case. Sadly, there was no real evidence for a fire-related accident that was predictable. His body was found by a fireplace, but Assistant Chief Officer Jerry O'Malley said that the fire officers had concluded that an open fire had not been the cause of the blaze. Fire officers were unable to actually determine a cause of the origin of the fire. The state pathologist, Professor Grace Callagy, noted in her post-mortem findings that the victim had type 2 diabetes and hypertension, but concluded he had not died from any heart failure. His body, however, had been extensively burned, and because of the extensive damage to his organs, it was not possible to determine a cause of death. The West Galway coroner, Dr. Kieran McLaughlin, said that it was the first time in 25 years of investigating deaths that he'd seen such a case. Baffled, he had to officially record it as that which had yet to be scientifically legitimized. He recorded the cause of death as spontaneous human combustion. There are so many similar cases throughout history. In 1986, the charred body of a 58-year-old retired firefighter, George Mott, was found in his apartment outside Crown Point, New York. All that was left of him was a leg, a shrunken skull, and pieces of his ribcage. In 2011, a case was reported regarding an unnamed Swedish man who seemingly spontaneously burst into flames while standing outside a record shop, but he was saved by an off-duty tram driver who tackled and extinguished the fire. The amount of these cases would suggest that there's such a thing as spontaneous human combustion, but there's just one small problem with that theory. The human body isn't flammable, and drinking alcohol does not make a human body any more flammable, and we've known this for a long time. In 1851, J. von Liebig, the father of the fertilizer industry and the man who popularized the Liebig condenser, demonstrated through a series of unethical tests that anatomical tissue soaked in alcohol was not harmed by fire. The logic didn't, and still does not, sell papers. Spontaneous human combustion makes for a very good story, so much so that authors began including it in their books. In his 1842 book, Dead Souls, Nikolai Gogol details how a drunken blacksmith burned to death through, quote, too much drink. Herman Melville included a drunken sailor in his 1849 novel, Redburn, who caught on fire with greenish flames spitting from his mouth as he died. In 1883, Mark Twain wrote of a man called Jimmy Finn, who died of spontaneous human combustion, and Charles Dickens wrote a character, Mr. Crook of Bleak House, who was a heavy drinker, and he is eventually found as a charred pile of ash in a small area of a burned floor. Dickens was criticised at the time for including such unscientific death in his work by a scientist, George Henry Lewes, but Dickens rebuted the criticism, claiming that he based the fictional event on 30 cases of spontaneous human combustion which he has studied. In his paper on the subject, Brian J. Ford looks at the history of alleged spontaneous human combustion and writes the following. Some, but not all, of the victims were alcoholics. Some, but not all, were overweight. Some, but not all, were old and enfeebled. And some, but not all, smoked cigarettes. Their individual factors changed, but all of their conditions resulted in one potential common factor. Their blood glycogen levels were likely depleted. Glycogen is a stored form of glucose that's made up of many connected glucose molecules. And glucose is the body's main source of energy. When cells cannot rely on conventional energy sources, it uses fat molecules as a source. When fatty acids are used for energy through beta-oxygenation 
Acetyl CoA is created through their breakdown, which helps drive the Krebs cycle within the mitochondria. If the body cells suffer starvation, which can occur during either chronic illnesses or even during exercise, acetyl CoA in the liver is translated into acetoacetate, and this can decarboxylate into acetone. Now, acetone is that thing that you may have heard of. It appears in nail varnish removers and exists in very small amounts in the human body. But unlike the human body, Acetone is highly flammable and can ignite at a concentration below 14%. Brian J. Ford conducted a series of experiments to test this theory, including a finger-thick portion of porcine abdominal wall that had been soaked in acetone, which he secured to a makeshift chair made of aluminium foil. He placed a small butane flame close to the subject and without even contacting it, it burst into flames. The specimen burned for approximately four minutes before the flames died down. What remained in the aluminium cradle was a small, blackened mass of ash. The little chair was left standing in a liquid pool of melted body fat, which solidified into a solid yellow mass that glued the model chair to the base of the experimental stage. This result echoes some of the notes of alleged spontaneous human combustion reports, such as that of the police officer John Hamer, who wrote of a case in South Wales in 1980, quote, the charred portion of the rug and carpet was saturated in melted human fat. Ford did another experiment, mimicking a clothed substitute body in a chair. He constructed a 1 12th scale model human from tissue cut into a shape of a human, infused with acetone for five days, and then clothed the tissue before putting it on a miniature wooden chair. Ford placed a gas lighter near the model and there was a burst of flames and the vapour caught fire. This specimen had been placed on a little tile and another tile propped up behind it and then a little carpet was placed beneath the chair. 16 minutes later, the intense heat of the burning pool of fat on the carpet continued to build up until the solid tile beneath it could not withstand it and the tile shattered. The specimen continued to burn for an additional 40 minutes and was completely consumed by fire before becoming blackened ash. Now, whilst we can't quantify the proportions of acetone found in the tissues of the patients of ketosis that were unfortunate victims of spontaneous human combustion and Ford's experiments are self-admittedly not conclusively detailed, Ford's experiments pose a more plausible model for the alleged spontaneous human combustion. It would appear that people with more acetone in their body, potentially from glycogen depletion, are more likely to burst into flames, but not self-ignition. It would have to come from an outside source. So really, the main takeaway is, if you're susceptible to ketosis, stay away from open flames and try not to dress in nylon. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and commenting or subscribing. And thank you to my patrons as always for making this video possible. And I'll see you soon for another video. And remember, books save lives. So keep reading.